Welcome to the uh, interviewing on Wall Street panel, everyone. Uh, my name is Pat Majidi. I'm the dean of the uh, Villanova School of Business. And uh, I've been the dean for a few months, and I would say that uh, one of the things that I enjoy most is getting the chance to visit with our esteemed alumni and see how engaged and interested they are to uh, help us in so many different ways. And one of the ways that is most impactful is uh, their participation in events like this that uh, enable you all to get a preview into careers, to have opportunities to network, and to learn more about the opportunities that you might have in your future. So before uh, begin, we begin, I wanted to thank the Clay Center, the Villanova School of Business, the, and the University Career Center, as well as the Equity Society, the Fixed Income Society, and the Villanova Technical Analysis Group uh, and, of course, uh, we wouldn't be able to have this event at the Villanova Financial Club, uh, who so many other members are here today. Special thanks from uh, the Clay Center, uh, Michelle Galloway, uh, who has uh, taken the lead on this event, and Carol Lloyd and Brenda Stover, Carol from the uh, Career Services, Brenda Stover also from BSV, I'd like to thank them. So this, uh, this event is in its ninth year, and as I mentioned, the Villanova Financial Club, which is comprised of uh, Villanova alumni in working in financial services, uh, they came up with this idea, and um, this, this event has really touched many hundreds of students over the past, uh, this is again the ninth year. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, Mr. Bill Donnell, who is one of the founders of this event in the Villanova Financial Club, but I wanted to first just congratulate those of you that are here. This is a good opportunity. And the fact that you're sitting here and you're taking this initiative, I think, speaks highly of each and every one of you and, uh, and your future potential for success. So uh, Bill Donnell is a um, 77 graduate from marketing. So I think one of the lessons from today's uh, event is that um, Wall Street and financial services is not just for building a school of business students. And I know many of you out there aren't from the building of the school of business. Uh, he's been with Merrill Lynch since 1993 and has extensive, he's a um, vice pre senior vice president for wealth management for Bank of America Merrill Lynch. Has extensive experience in selecting and evaluating investments, client portfolios, and designing long term financial strategies. Past chairman of Merrill Lynch's National Advisory Council to Management and Private Banking and Investment Group, um, excuse me, um, to Management and the Private Banking and Investment Group Advisory Council to Management. Uh, he's won a number of awards, but I think the one that I would most like to highlight is the Bartley Alumni Medallion that he received from the Villanova School of Business in recognition of his work in spearheading the creation of student internship programs. And uh, you just have to take my word for it, the work that he has done and along with the Villanova Financial Club is, is unbelievable in terms of finding jobs for Villanovans. Uh, currently, he's still involved with Villanova. He sits on the President's Leadership Council, the Dean's Advisory Council at Villanova School of Business. He's the past President and Acting Treasurer, as I mentioned, of the Villanova Financial Club. He's participated in all previous eight annual programs here, like today's, um, along with George Coleman, who I'm going to let Bill introduce, but who also is a founder of, uh, of this initiative. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Bill Donnell. So um, I'd like to, again, as, as Ian said, and by the way, thank you very much for those kind words. I don't know how true they were, but uh, they were very kind nonetheless. Um, uh, like Ian said, I graduated here in 1977. Um, I've been at Merrill Lynch for 30 years in their wealth management for, for private bank. All three of my children went here. Uh, I met my wife here, and many of my clients uh, are the owners. So I, would, I feel like I have an awful lot to give back because everything I have today traces back to the Villanova University. Myself and Kate and George are all members of the Villanova Financial Club. And basically what this is, is it's a group of 85 Villanovans who work on, well, in and around Wall Street. Um, and most of what we do, yes, is a social side, but most of what we do is, is try to give back in terms of an internship program, an mentorship program, programs like this and trying to help you, if you choose to work on Wall Street, helping you find your way to a career on Wall Street. 
And 10 years ago, George and I thought about this program after a couple of missteps with uh, some students. And we got together with Brenda Stover and designed this program. And it's changed a little bit each year. You know, I see one student over here who's on his four year, and this his fourth year. But and, and you'll, you'll agree with me, every year we come down, we do something a little bit different. One of the things that we initially noticed, and we did three and four each year, is that there's this love affair going on. And real love students love Wall Street, but in turn, Wall Street loves real love students. And Villanova is probably one of the 10 most employed universities on the street. And it is just, the evidence is this, is that there are 10 firms with 50 or more Villanova alums, most of which we want to give back. At City, Morgan Stanley, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, there are 300 alums. At, um, where George works, Fred Swiss and Chris work. At Barclays, and Goldman, and Deutsche Bank, there's anywhere from 80 to 120 Villanova alums. And we're not even talking about hedge funds, private equity firms, and smaller firms. Uh, my son graduated from here, works at a hedge fund with 50 people. 10 of the people that work in that firm are the office. I met another fellow from 96 along, not too long ago. He works at a small fixed income shop, 21 people in uh, Jersey City. 12 people work there from Villanova. So Villanova is kind of in sessions where they're all over. Um, the, set, the other thing that, that George and I talk about constantly is that over this, ten, this nine year period, one thing is very constant. Wall Street each year shrinks a little bit. The number of firms, the number of jobs. So it's getting more competitive. And when we started, we, one of the reasons why we got started with this, we weren't really that competitive in interviews. And we really, you guys have really picked up your game. But we need to pick it up every year because it's getting more competitive. More, more, more universities want Wall Street, more students want Wall Street. So you just have to keep ahead of that curve. The goal of today is simply, basically want to get two things done, okay? Number one is we want to teach you how to be, or show you how to be more competitive in the Wall Street interview. It's very different than if you're in communications, uh, like you interview with ESPN, we you, know, you work at a hospital, or an engineering firm. Uh, and it's very unique. And George is going to take you through the whole interview cycle, okay? Uh, the on-campus, the super day, he'll actually give you the, the answers, the questions and the answers. He will tell, tell you what's going behind those questions, what are they really looking for. The second thing that we want to get done here is we want to expose you to three very wide careers, very rewarding careers. I think almost every year, George and I, this program and a couple others, probably speak to about 500 students. And I, if I ask everyone, where, they, where do you want to work? They would say, Wall Street, of course. I say, what do you want to do? And they define Wall Street as sales and trading or investment banking. But if I look, I help run a recruiting program at, at our bank, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch. And we brought in 16 students who graduated this past May. Of those 16, anybody want to guess how many were from investment banking and sales and trading? One. Two. Okay. The other 14, okay, 14 out of 16, are working in financial operations, Todd Sullivan, wealth management, Kate Waters, um, FMAP, or CFO program, the finance side of, of these firms, Chris Weidler, and Marcus. Okay. So we want to talk to you a little bit about those programs. Everybody on this day is here. Um, we're all alums. We all want to help. Okay. Between, between us all up here, we have about 120, about 100, just about 100 years worth of experience. So let me do this. Let me introduce um, everybody up here, and I'll turn the program to George Coleman in a minute. Uh, George Coleman, good friend of mine from Illinois, who is a fraternity, um, is a 78 alum. He was an accounting major. He started his career at Credit Suisse as a, as a sales trader, equity sales trader. Um, he rose very quickly. He was a managing director. He is now um, vice chairman of Global Equities. He sits on the management committee. In other words, he's a pretty big dealer. Okay, so I'll take you through that whole that whole interview process uh, that I was talking about. Next up will be Todd Sullivan, sitting to George's left. 
Uh, Todd is uh, graduated here in 95. He went on for his MBA uh, at NYU in Finance and Operations. He is the Managing Director at Morgan Stanley okay, in the Operations Division. And he is Global Head of Interest Rate and Derivative Operations. Very sophisticated, uh, very sophisticated position. He joined Morgan Stanley in 2004 after a nine-year career at um, Lehman Brothers. Sitting to Todd's left is Kate Waters. Okay, Kate um, is a 98 alum. Uh, she's in the financial club. She was a double major here. Kate, it took me a while to get that down when I was talking to you. You know, she, she was a finance major, get this, an English major. Ouch. Um, so when Kate graduated, she graduated in 98, and she went on to work for a small boutique uh, investment banking firm on Wall Street. And they specialized in M&A, private placements, and IPOs. And she did a complete turnaround. Uh, she, she jumped over to Smith Barney, who then was uh, merged later on with Morgan Stanley. And she joined the wealth management team. And today, she's a partner in that wealth management team. It's a large team over at Morgan Stanley Smith Barney. And basically, she works with uh, clients. They may, may look like your parents. Uh, and then she handles their entire financial picture. And she's going to talk to you about that as well. And then to Kate's left is Chris Wilder. And Kate, uh, Susan, Chris spoke with us last year. Um, he graduated in 97 with, with a, an accounting degree. He joined Barclays in 2005. He's the global head of financial reporting and control. He's also CEO of the Americas. Um, and he spent the years prior, right after graduation, right up to 2005, at Price Waterhouse Coopers in both the London and New York office. Those are the four alums. Uh, George and I haven't done some, we did something a little different we haven't done since 2004. We asked a senior to be with us, and that's Chris Conner at the end. I don't know if you, you, know, you recognize him. He's a senior, he's a finance major, and basically anybody a junior, anybody, okay, you want to be him. Okay, because he sat in your chair exact in this room a year ago today. And then he competed successfully in the fall. He went on over 25 different interviews and landed a position on the Merrill Lynch Equity Trading Desk. Uh, he started there in, uh, in June, right? In June. He was there until uh, till the end of July. And at the end of July, he was, he was probably at uh, several hundred summer analysts, one of the top three or four. He was offered a position and he accepted. So today he walks into the senior year before he even got here. He has a full-time offer to start on the Merrill Lynch Equity Sales and Trading Desk next July, literally cash is popping. So, um, and he's going to talk a little bit about some of the things that he did right in the interview process, some of the things that he maybe did wrong, and some of the things that he wished he did. So let me do this. Let me turn uh, the program over to my good friend George Coleman, and uh, we'll move on. the technical thing. How many people here are not from the Villanova School of Business? There you go, I like that, yeah. Hey, I congratulate you, that's pretty good. You know. How'd you find out? You just saw it in the, your, your roommate told you or something? Anyone from engineering? <laughs> I know, seriously, uh, I, I'd really like to add my congratulations to all of you to take as much interest in, uh, in your career. Uh, it, it shows a lot of uh, initiative. Uh, those of you who are freshmen, raise your hand. Uh, that's really good. Awesome. That's really good. This, we've made a lot of progress on that. Um, because, you know, with all due respect to the seniors, um, a lot of what I'm going to talk about is geared to the sophomores. How are you guys doing here? So, because, you know, the truth of the matter is, is that, you know, by the time you're a senior and you're interviewing for some of the things I'm going to talk about, it, the game is, is kind of over, that kind of, it, it's, 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 it's over, you know? And, and so getting that job, that summer internship, your junior summer, is the ultimate goal if you want to do a number of different positions. You know, I would tell you in my career, you know, all the things I'm gonna tell you in terms of GPA, SATs, et cetera, et cetera, I didn't qualify for any of them, you know, and I'm the vice chairman. So for those of you who are like, you know, don't have a three, six, you know, there's a lot of hope. And a lot of what we talk about does apply. You know, having said that, uh, grades do matter. Go to class. Um, 
the Leonine fraternity brothers. I was the president of the fraternity, he was social chairman. You know, we're still kind of tag teaming. You know. So now, this probably move it. There you go. All right, so really kind of alluded to um, this Venn diagram is, uh, you know, there's a lot of things you can do in a bank slash investment bank. And, you know, everybody who meets me wants to be an investment banker or they want to be a trader. Um, and the truth of the matter is that if you go to that upper left-hand corner, you know, that's investment banking, which is where I work in the sales and trading area. And, and you know, there's a lot of jobs there. But, you know, Kate and Billy work in wealth management. Uh, and I can tell you, there's more jobs there, especially in this environment. And then, if you go to the bottom, asset management is kind of like Vanguard, Fidelity, et cetera. We don't have anybody on the panel that would represent that area. But again, that's an area that is growing, and there's lots of really good jobs. You know? and, and every investment bank uh, has an asset management division. And then the center, we call it shared services. Other firms may call it something else. But you know, it's, it's you know, human resources. My daughter who graduated in 2011 works in human, human resources. Um, information technology is the backbone of our business. It is a constant growing area. You know, it's, it, it's expensive, but it's an area that's it's critically important to make, make it work. Legal compliance, Dodd-Frank, is a growth business. If you want to make sure you get a job and train that you're getting here in the old school business, clearly qualifies you to work in areas like that. Operations risk. There are a lot of jobs in that middle section. And what I thought I would just show you is um, these are the summer interns from Credit Suisse from last summer. Um, I don't have the, asset, the, the wealth management part on here because our, our wealth management business relative to, say, Merrill Lynch and Morgan Stanley is much, much smaller. But if you add up all those numbers, it adds up to 363, I think. Please don't check my math. Um, but you can see that investment banking was 130 of the, of the uh, 363 jobs. And the securities division, which is investment banking, where, where, where I work, sales and trading, is another 71. So 56% so of the jobs are in an area that you, know, you all always tell us you want to work in. The other you know, 40, 40, uh, 44% are in shared services, asset management. And this is really not right. Because as I told you, wealth management's not in here. If wealth management was in here, it would tilt the other way. It'd probably be 60% outside of investment banking and sales and trading. Now, if you really want to be an investment banker and you really want to be in sales and trading, my advice is go for it, do it, follow your passion, follow what you care about. But at, at the same time, be realistic that, you know, think about Credit Suisse. There's se 71 jobs in the entire equity and fixed income department at Credit Suisse. It's really not that many when you consider that we go to 10 core schools and you can guarantee you can probably figure out who they are. And that was, that, that, those are the people you're competing against. So our advice is to just think about, you know, I don't know how many go backwards, but th those shared services roles, those wealth management roles, and those, those, those roles in asset management. Um, so the, the, the five, so what I'm going to walk you through now are um, Billy and I were in this fraternity and we used to have this thing called the files and basically it was the old tests that, that, that the seniors would pass on to the freshmen, you know, and it's kind of a joke, but like in the great tradition of giving people the answers to the test, I'm going to give you the answers to the test. I'm going to tell you how we train people to interview you, okay? So the first thing that, you know, we're looking for in people is we're looking for team players. And by the way, we're going to give you these slides. So you guys want to take notes? You can. But the reality is Brenda's going to give you all the slides. There's, you know, there's nothing proprietary here. We're all in the same family. So we're looking for team, we're looking for team players. We're looking for people who, who get along with people. It, it, in this business, there's a lot of pressure. You sit really tight like everyone up here is sitting next to each other. One of the big things that's going to happen in the interview is someone's going to say, what I really like to sit next to this guy, Bill. What I really like to sit next to this girl, this gal, Mary. Yeah. Um, we're looking for smart people. We're looking for people who can figure things out. You know, for those of you, all the freshmen and sophomores, go to class. Do not miss a class. Get a 3-6. You know, you know you went, I've seen the, the data on what the freshman classes, SATs are, GPAs, class rank. You are smart. You are just as smart as the person in Princeton that we hired. You know, but if you don't go to class here, and you don't get a 3-6, it's going to be very, very difficult for you to compete against them. Communication skills. You know, 
you know, you're, you're during the summer internship, and you know, I'd like you to actually touch on this if, if Merrill does it, but like at Credit Suisse, you need to make two presentations at the end of the 10-week period, one in a group format, one in an individual format. To the extent that you can put yourself in positions where you have to do what I'm doing right now, and then let me tell you, when I was your age, it was really hard. Um, you need to take public speaking classes, you need to practice this, you need to be good at it. Um, we're, looking for, we're looking for people who want to work. We're looking for examples of initiative and drive. How many people here in high school was, were catty? That's good. If you're a freshman, do it again. You know, because we like caddies. How many people here have been a waitress or a waiter? You know, that's good. Now, I won't ask this because you know, everyone's always embarrassed, but like, you know, if you work at McDonald's, I like that. We like that. We like people who want to work. You know, now, you guys all think that you, all we're going to care about is this internship and that internship. The truth of the matter is, some internship that you did your senior, between senior year in high school and freshman year coming here, if you, know, you worked at some law firm, the reality is I know what you were doing. You were pushing paper, answering the phone. I would rather you be you know, on the golf course in a restaurant getting yelled at. So you're building that character of how to you know, work under stress. And lastly, and mo probably most importantly, we're looking for leaders. We're looking for people who are natural leaders. You know, it's, like, it's interesting to me that, you know, just in my own life, that you know, when I was younger and I was in the Boy Scouts, I became the head of the Boy Scouts. You know, when I was in high school, I was the captain of my swim team. When I was here, I was the president of my fraternity. And then when I'm at Credit Suisse, I run the equity department. You know, it's like, when you look at people who are successful, you know, they have these leadership traits. So we're, you know, we're going to talk about opportunities for you to, to develop those. So this is a really noisy slide. And so that's why I'm going to give it to you. You know, but like you know, things on the left hand side, I can't see it myself. <laughs> um, no, but like it's examples of like being president of a, of a, of a sorority or, or a, a fraternity. Um, you know, it's too late now, but people who are Eagle Scouts, um, people who are presidents of chari charity organizations on campus, uh, people involved in the news. The, the uh, school newspaper, etc. Uh, I talked about academic excellence and performance. You know, it matters a lot. It matters a lot to have good grades. If you're an athlete, there's a lot of opportunity to demonstrate leadership. You know, be the captain of the team. Um, I talked about work ethic. You know, these are these are things that every firm will be looking for as predictors of success. So find a way to get involved in it. And how many people here have been on one of those? Um, what do you call it? The mission? Or you know, the spring break, you go away to Costa Rica mission trip? Service trip. Habitat. Service, 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 service trip. Service trip, thank you. you know, how many of you have ever been on a service trip? You know, I tell in your interview, that's important to us. We care that you care. And if you're on a service trip, you know what my suggestion is? Be in charge of the service trip. Go one step forward. Special Olympics is a big deal here, right? You know, get involved in it. But not only get involved in it, get in charge of it. Take, take, say, I would like to do more. We're interested in people who want to do more. Um, this is a, 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 taking the prior slide, I have a team of 10 people inside Credit Suisse that I ask them to put together, in their opinion, what are the things you could do here at Credit Suisse that reflect the prior slide? So I'm not gonna read this to you, but it's like, I don't know what Bigs and Littles is, and, and, sororities and fraternities and stuff, but I think that has something to do with some charity thing. Habitat for Humanity, you know, campus ministry, Special Olympics. You know, there's a lot of opportunity to do more than just be a 3-6 student. All right, here's the ultimate answer to the test. You know, again, you know, you, you don't have to be able to read it just when you look at the attack. This is the form that my people fill out when you walk out of the room. So I'm going to walk you through in a minute exactly what's going to happen in the interview. But you need to be able to say to yourself in an outline, when someone asks you the leadership question, when somebody asks you the driving results question, what's your answer going to be? You know, all right, so Billy, I mean, real quick, you know, here's how it's good. There's two rounds of interviews. There's first round and what's called super day. First round is going to be when somebody comes here on campus and you, you know, there's a resume dump and they pick 12 people and, Etc. 
Um, there's going to be red opportunities for you to come and sit on the trading desk or come to New York and sit, you know, sit in our offices. Uh, you may be an HR recruiter, and Credit, Credit Suisse has actually initiated this new thing last year. We're actually doing this virtually. You know, so we're going to do a webcast about exactly what is investment banking, what are all the different opportunities. We actually interviewed 360 students last year uh, on, on a webcam. It's not it's like Skype. It's not exactly Skype. It's like Skype. So you're going to see things like that more and more. Super Day is once you get past the first round, it's basically you'll be invited to New York. There'll be about 30 candidates. Um, you'll be go through five 30-minute interviews in a row. It's two and a half hours. It's grueling. Make sure you go to sleep the early night before. Make sure you're, you know, really thought about this. Make sure you think about what you're going to eat and drink the day before. Emphasis on the drink. You know? um, and, and I would tell you that if you get the chance to go to Super Day, where some, some of the people here who have got some of the seniors who have jobs already, this is the Super Bowl. This is it. You're competing against those other people who are in, in, in your group that day. Your job offers go out the next day. They actually decide, you guys leave, we sit around and have some pizza, we rank the people, we rank the candidates, et cetera, et cetera, and we say, okay, these six or five or six or seven are getting jobs, that's it. So if you, if you can just get Super Day, go for it. All right, um, what I'm gonna try to talk about here is, these are the best practices that we basically, when, we, if, when I'm teaching somebody how to approach an interview, how to interview you, this is what I'm telling you. This is, I'm telling this from the interviewer's perspective. So, you know, it's, it's the interviewer's job is to figure out, okay, these, these core competencies that I already went through with you, it's their job to kind of elicit that information from you. They have to be clear about which competency they're kind of testing you for, and their job is to talk, to let you talk 80% of the time. You will find that most interviewers like to hear themselves, so you're gonna have to be aggressive in terms of pushing them say, I want to talk, you, you, you guys stop talking. Uh, the opening will be something very simple and that they'll greet you, you know, and then they're going to find something on your resume that they have in common with you. So it might be golf, it might be lacrosse, it might be field hockey, uh, it might be, you know, where you went to high school or Jersey Shore or something, but they'll ask you a real softball question that will put, try to put you at ease. Uh, then they're going to spend, let's say that's two minutes. You've got 30 minutes. We're going to break this 30 minutes down. You've got to think about it, right? So they're going to spend two minutes putting you at ease, maybe three. They're going to spend the next 20 minutes trying to drill down on these five core competencies. And then there's going to be, you know, three, five minutes left at the end. And they're going to ask you if you have any questions. And my very strong advice there is to have said to yourself, okay, I had five core competencies I wanted to cover. During that time, you have to kind of say to the, to the George Coleman or whoever the heck it is, these are the reasons why you want to hire me. You want to hire me because, you know, I'm a caddy, I want to work hard, I'm the captain of this team, I'm the president of my sorority, I'm, you know, blah, 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 blah. But you go for it. Ask for the order and be prepared to ask, you know, a question that can relate to the firm that they work for. So if you're talking to Kate and it's Morgan Stanley, you know, and you know, there's all this stuff going on about Smith Barney and Morgan Stanley and this merger. Like, you have to be able to just say, hey, could you tell me about the merger and how it impacts your job? Yeah. And, and, and she will recognize that you're paying attention and think that you're smart. All right, so I can't emphasize this enough. Yeah. Prepare, prepare, prepare. Um, the way I talk to the people who work for me, 2,700 people in the equity department, our CEO is a guy named Brady Dugan. And I say to them all the time, if you had a meeting tomorrow with your largest client, with Brady Dugan, what would you be doing today? And that would be the obvious answer is, you'd be getting ready. You'd be preparing to prepare him to go see this client so that you know what you're talking about. She, treat yourself with the same respect that you would treat the CEO of the firm. Meaning, you owe it to yourself to prepare. And we're down here giving you the answers to the test, so it really shouldn't be that difficult. So prepare, prepare, and then prepare some more. 
Um, I'm not going to read all these two, but I gave you example questions. These are questions that we give our employees to help them figure out how to you know, ask you questions. So I'm just going to kind of blow through these you, because you already have them and I can read them to you. But I would tell you, having interest in the industry, having interest in current events. What happened today, guys? Yeah. What happened last Friday? You can answer. What's the single most important economic number that comes out every month? Comes out on Friday. Right. You know, it's kind of like, you know, it's, it's, you know, if I ask any of you to give me your view on where, you know, the 10 year, the 10 year bond yields like 1.7 or something like that, thereabouts, you know. All right, if I say to you, what, give me a scenario where it goes to 2%, give me a scenario where it goes to one and a half. You, you need to be prepared for someone to ask you something like that. And you don't have to be right. You just have to have a view and have the ability to back up the view. Um, these are some just basic stuff that you know people mess up all the time. You know, handshakes are really, really important. There is nothing worse than the fish. You know, you know, there's just nothing worse than it. And if you're a woman, which hopefully half of you are, you know, and, and you know, shake somebody's hand like firmly, like you know, none of this dainty like you know stuff, queen, you know, Queen of England stuff, you know, you know, it's like it says here, it should not be too hard, it should not be too soft, maintain, maintain eye contact. It's actually, it sounds so obvious, you'd be amazed how many people don't do it. Um, what's appropriate? For men, wear a suit. I was really impressed last year when I did these Skype interviews, you know, we did the virtual ones, that everybody I interviewed either had a suit or a dress or they were made up. They weren't sitting there in their dorm room, which they were in their dorm room, but they weren't sitting there in their sweatpants with a blown on t-shirt on. You know, they, they, they got dressed for success. Um, if you're coming, you know, if you're going to do it in person, which 99% of the time, uh, those who've been here before have heard me tell the story about the guy that showed up with the shirt that was eggplant. You know, it's like really simple. I mean, I look at this group here, but like everybody has on a white or blue shirt, right? You know, if you watch the presidential debates, I'll bet everybody here a hundred dollars. You know, it, it, both guys will have a white shirt on, and they'll have a light blue tie or they'll have a red tie. You know, there's a reason they do that. You know why? It looks good. You want the job? Look like this guy in the front row. You look perfect. Yeah. No, you got a blue tie, a white shirt. You're, you're fine. You're fine. You know, it's uh, women wear a suit. You know, um, if you don't have one, nice pants, skirt. You know, you know, just look nice. You know, and you know, Billy tells the story of uh, some gal that showed up with like some mid drifting out with like a, a piercing in her belly shirt. Belly shirt. Or I don't know. What exactly. <laughs> Like, you know something? It's like, it's a 100% chance you're not going to get hired if you show up with that. It's a 100% chance. So just don't do it. You know? Like, don't waste your time. Don't waste our time. You know? Like, dress to win. You know? Um, you know, fix your hair. You know, put your makeup on. You know, look groomed. If you're a guy, you know, like, get your hair cut, comb your hair. You know? I mean, I know this sounds silly. I mean, I'm probably sound like your father. My youngest child is 24, so, like, it's like, I am old enough to be your father. But, guys, it matters. And people screw it up all the time. Um, what do we got here? Introduce yourself, smile, shake hands, be confident. Um, you know, don't smoke, don't swear, don't chew gum. Uh, and then it's it, you know things that we hate. And again, I'm not going to read all these to you. I told you the bad handshake, uh, eating late, that's awful. You know, bad manners, swearing, uh, looking at the floor, mumbling. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, what I would say to you is, just go for it. You know, be prepared. This is the Super Bowl. You guys are winners. You would not be in this school if you weren't winners. You are as smart as everybody I know who works for me who goes to Princeton. All right, so, have any of you ever seen this slide before? I actually haven't seen it until about an hour ago. What this slide represents is, this is my pitch to you as you become an alumnus. So five years ago, four years ago, only 17% of all the alumni made a donation to the school. You know, in the last couple of years, we've worked really hard on it, so we've moved it from you know, 17, 19, 21. It's now 23% of, of, of our alumni make a donation of any kind. Now, why do I put this up here? Why have I been coming down here for nine years in a row? Somebody changed my life 
twice. Once helping me come to the school, and secondly, somebody from Villanova helped me get the job at Craig Swiss. I never would have been a vice chairman. You know, it's important that we all give back. Now, let me ask a question. How many of you have had a friend or sister or brother come visit and you take them to Barclay to get something to eat? Were you embarrassed by the building or proud of it? Who paid for it? Not you guys. Someone who came before you paid for it. You know? How many of you have ever sent an email to an alumnus to ask them to either help you get in here or most, most importantly, get an internship? Yeah. Well, guess what? Is that fair? For you to go to send an email to me and ask for help and then not get back to school? Yeah. So, how much do you enjoy beating Georgetown in basketball? A lot or a little? All right. Guess what their number is? We're 23. They're 30. What is BC? 30. What's Notre Dame? 46. What's Princeton? 65. So as, as your life goes on, I'd like you to remember that you know this panel took the time to come down here. You know, Billy and I have been doing this for nine years. You know, and, and believe me, I don't care if you get ten dollars or ten million dollars. We just want everybody to participate. So I'll be around if you want to ask some more questions when we're done. Thank you. So we've done um, slightly different formats each year that I've been on this panel with George and with Bill. And I think what we're going to do, um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the things that are different about working in the kinds of roles that I come down here and interview for um, from what George just took you through for the sales and trading um, interview process. The, I guess, good news or the consistent message is not that different. Um, the structure and the format is pretty consistent across the firms. Uh, most major investment banks will operate the way George just took you through that structure come down here, usually on campus. Um, certainly Morgan Stanley comes down and we do a lot of hiring here at Villanova, so we'll, it's worth our time to come down and meet a bunch of students in one day. Uh, we actually try to do first and second round here on campus uh, at the same time. So you'll end up in, in that cycle going through at least three, sometimes four interviews um, and some kind of a group exercise. Um, so you get kind of a super day and your first round interviews here on campus all in one shot. Um, the decisions still get made just as quickly. We come down here with a quota for the number of people we're looking for. Um, you typically get, I don't know, probably 80 to 150 resumes um, when we advertise for interviews. Um, we'll pick somewhere between 25 and 30 people to meet with the first time around. Depends on the quality of the, of the resumes and the number of people I bring down with me to interview because we're going to have a certain number of slots we can get through each day. First round, we'll each meet with, with, a, with the candidate once, and at the end of the day, we make a list and, we, and cut it. Um, call the next group back for the next day, you'll go through a couple more interviews, and then you go through some kind of a group exercise. Most times, you will get put in some kind of a team group exercise now, and to, to George's point, talking about um, wanting to see how you work with people, whether or not you're somebody we want to sit next to, and you do. I mean, if you thought George was kidding, he wasn't. This is how close you sit together at work, so you have to be able to get along with the people you work with. Um, maybe on the wealth management side, you guys get a little bit more space. A little bit more space. Yeah. <laughs> um, you do have to be able to work with people and sit next to them and spend and sit next to them not for an eight-hour day because none of us works an eight-hour day. Um, you got to like the people you're with. So we, we put you in a group exercise. We take you out of your comfort zone a little bit, give you an assignment you couldn't possibly have prepared for, and see how you react. Um, that's to do a couple of things. One, it's to see how you work with your peers, to see who emerges as the ass, who emerges as the leader. Or, you know, who sink, sinks into the corner and doesn't do anything, um, and how you respond to a totally unexpected set of instructions. Um, typically gets layered on with some change of instruction halfway through and cutting the timeline you have to finish it, and then you have to present something or tell us what you did or tell us what the point was. And there are no right answers in this, but there's certainly wrong behavior. Right? So you want to think about the way you behave, the way you conduct yourself in a group. If that's something you're really uncomfortable with, practice a little bit. Right? You've all got group assignments, you've all got group projects to do here in school. Think about how you can take those experiences and practice what you're going to have to do when you get to an interview. Um, talking about um, the types of jobs that you can do outside of sales, trading, investment banking, the typical things that you all grew up thinking we do on Wall Street, um, and now we're starting to realize that about 20% of the jobs are actually those jobs. 
Um, I run an operations division. I hire somewhere between 15 and 20 people between internships and full-time analyst programs out of Villanova every year. Um, that's a lot more than our sales and training team does down here. The reality is, as George said, they're going to, the sales and training programs tend to go to you know, 10, maybe 12, maybe eight target schools. Um, there aren't many of them that spend a lot of time on this campus. You can get there, you can find ways to get doors open, but if you want to talk about the volume of opportunities here, it's not going to be in sales and trading. So if you're looking to up your odds, especially in this market, look at all the jobs that are out there, right? And recognize that at 21, 22 years old, you haven't actually picked the career path that you have to follow. So look at financial control. Chris can talk a little bit about, about the accounting and finance side of the business, which is not public accounting, pencil pushing, tax returns. Right? It's, it's, it's a, an integral part of this business. Talk to me about operations roles, responsible from everything from when a trade gets done till money and securities are moving in and out of the bank to resolving issues and errors with customers to liquidating customers when things go bad. And they've gone bad a couple times in my career. Um, other differences and things to think about when you look at jobs outside of sales and trading and banking. You know, George, you've been in equity side of the market your entire career. My entire career. Yeah. Um, it's unlikely you would wake up someday and say, gee, I'm going to think I'm going to go trade commodities. Um, I, would, I don't have the skills. <laughs> in operations, the skills are being in operations. It's not product specific. So it, it affords you a flexibility to do different things. Now, there's certainly specialties and skills you can develop in the sort of corporate services for the company, um, but they're not product specific. So if you're looking for something that's going to give you an opportunity to see lots of different parts of this business, um, and figure out if you've got some affinity or desire to do something specific, operations is a place to do that. Financial control can be a place to do that, where you're going to get to see lots of different parts of the business. Um, if you are a self-starter, self-driven um, you know, person who wants to be involved with individual people, a wealth management business is going to let you actually talk to and touch customers. Uh, be a little bit different. Kate can talk about, a little bit about that. Um, I've certainly got lots of other sort of life lessons and, and things to teach you about what to do and not to do in interviews. Um, as a reformed smoker, how many of you guys smoke? I'm not going to remember. Put your hands up. That's Don't up. lie, because I know people smoke on this campus. That's, up. That's impressive. Or it's bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if you smoke, and it's okay. No, it's not okay, because I'm a dad now too. But um, Don't smoke before you go to an interview. Okay? The best thing that can happen is you're in front of a smoker who still smokes, and they don't notice. That's the best that can happen. Worst can happen is you sit with me and I still get neck fits if I smell it, or it makes me sick. Okay? Don't smoke. Go, go without the cigarette for an hour or two before the interview. Um, if you chew gum, don't do that in the interview. If you wear an earring, and I got a hole in my ear, I haven't worn one in 20 years, don't wear it for the interview. Again, the best that can happen is nothing. The worst is you offend somebody, or you piss them off, or you make them pass judgment. Okay? Think about the way you present yourself. And George said comb your hair. That's, a, that's obviously a given. But think about the way you present yourself and the image and who you're sitting with. Right? Your peers, your parents, your friends, your professors may be totally cool what you're doing. <clears throat> recognize that we all put a suit and tie on every day. Uh, we expect when you want to come work for us that you recognize that and respect that. Um, talk, other things I'm talking about? Yeah, just, just talk about what does somebody who works in operations, what do they look like? like what type oh, of person? Skills. Terrific. So skills. How, how many of you were not VSB? Good. I was a political science major. Okay, you guys can get jobs too. Um, we actually look for it. Okay, it's one of the things I come down when I come to Villanova is I, I try to find non-finance, non-accounting, non-economics majors because frankly I can't keep all you VSB guys from not applying. Um, so you show up anyway, but I go looking for the engineers, the political science, the math, the, the, the science, history, English. Um, it's a quantitative business. Every part of this business is a quantitative business. You have to be able to do math. But in the non-sales and trading roles and in probably the non-finance, you know, accounting roles, we're looking for people who come to this business with a, a diversity of perspective. This used to be a school where it was really hard to find diversity. I'm looking at this room and I'm amazed. I almost want to take a picture and go back to HR and say, see, the school's changed. Um, but you also come from a whole bunch of different backgrounds. Right? You've grown up in different places or in the world, in this country. You've gone through different academic programs. You think about things in a different way. If any of you are engineers, I saw a couple hands over here for engineering. You guys are going to approach a problem solving challenge in a different way than a finance major is. And in operations, and, and frankly I think in most of the, the, the central services of the firm, we're looking for people who think about projects and challenges and, and uh, problems from a different point of view. Because you put five finance majors together on a problem, you're going to get a pretty much finance answer. 
Now you put an engineer and a math major and a political science major and an English major and a finance major together, and you're going to almost always get a better answer. Yeah, right? and, and so, sorry, I know I'll, I'll talk a little bit in a minute, but working for a British bank, the, the thing that I've always found amazing is that the British education system has no such concept as an accounting degree. It's art, it's history, it's polit you know, it's math, um, and your job be is on the job training, right? Because you know, many of you will have accounting classes that are talking to you about cost of goods sold, and they're certainly not going to be talking to you about fixed income derivatives and the depth that, that Todd will need. And it's really about how you think. Um, yeah, I, I, have, I have a master's degree in operations and management, and they didn't teach me anything at NYU Stern School of Business that has anything to do with my job directly. Hey, what it taught me was ways to think about operations. Right? What they taught me was the way to run a plant, manufacturing cars and air conditioners and elevators and Think about throughput and efficiency and capacity. Right? Those are the concepts that I look to teach people in operations. Um, that you can't teach financial service operations because every firm is different, the systems are different, the technology is different. But if you've got a brain that likes to think that way, or you're not sure and you'd like to give it a try, there are careers on Wall Street that are very different from sales and trading, and certainly operations is one of them. Anything else I covered it usually? You got it. All right. Cool. Hey. Hi. Uh, so I think the first thing to kind of uh, talk about is people who are good in wealth management, people who are naturally, um, their natural ability, is, uh, they're people, pe they're people people. Um, both Bill and I were social chairs, so that's a very good, uh, I think, thing to be in a waitress or a caddy. These are people who are dealing with clients, you're dealing with wealthy people. So you're serving people. At the end of the day, we're serving clients. and. When we're looking, um, we're interviewing people, we're looking for people who one, our clients would want to see. So somebody who presents themselves well, someone who's confident. Uh, when you go for the interview, the first thing, uh, people are standing when you're um, be waiting to, to be interviewed. I think that's a great thing because you look confident, you look ready to go. Uh, we're problem solvers, we're always doing things, helping clients, so it's, um, you know, I think it, showing that confidence is a really great characteristic. Um, and also, I think, you know, using your connections, you know, I think when for, I built my business and built it as well, you know, we had to build it from scratch. We had, um, I was 24 years old and had to go get my own clients. So being able to find, make a connection with people, I think that's a great thing to do in the interview process because that's a skill that you'll need for the rest of your life. Certainly when you're building a business and trying to um, have clients invest their money with you, I think it's a great thing um, to do. And, Certainly, the Villanova community is great at that. Um, when you're, um, I think, when you're interviewing whoever the company is, always trying to make a connection, whether it's a college connection, whether it's a sports connection, whatever it is, you're trying to make the connection because you want the person to like you. And as everybody's probably going to say, you're, sit you're you're sitting next to this person, you're very close to them, you want to make sure you're someone that you're going to like and spend a lot of time with because you're with them more than you're with your family most of the time. Um, showing your well-roundedness, I think that's a really uh, good characteristic. Um, show, if you're taking initiatives, leading service trips, if you're involved in Blue Key Society or your sorority or fraternity or sports, whatever it is, it's, you want to kind of show people that you're not just, you know, on paper. You, you're actually a full person and wealth management, it's, it, at the end of the day, it's a people business. So. You know, trying to get that uh, across to whoever's interviewing you is a very um, key thing. I think also the when you're going to interview a company, do the research. I know we said prepare, prepare, prepare. It's true. Google, Google the company. Know everything that's going on in the company. Ask interesting questions. Don't just ask what's a typical day. You know, ask questions that you actually want to have an answer for. And you know you want the person who's interviewing you to actually think that you you've put some some thought into that. Uh, also, when you're looking, if you're thinking of getting into wealth management, and there's a lot of different areas. It's Bill and I are both advisors, so we lead teams where we have um, people who are support staff. Um, I have a person who's just focused on research, and she'll research um, individual companies, or uh, if we're using different products, and she's kind of. Get filtering that into us to um, so we can show our clients. There is support staff that um, that will focus on just the client service side. So being a client client service associate. So dealing with helping clients with check writing issues or whatever it is. So those are some of the different roles. Also, uh, marketing is another key role. 
Uh, we're, we have our own businesses. We're very entrepreneurial, and I think that's another key c component if you're thinking of getting into wealth management, showing that entrepreneurial spirit because that's, we run our own businesses. Uh, and marketing is a way to do that. So you have, if you have a background in marketing, I think it's a great thing to, um, to present when you're in the meeting. Uh, and if you're looking to get into wealth management, some, some key things I think were, were just no-brainers is I would Google Villanova and the company. I mean, you can, there, at every Wall Street firm there is a Villanova, many, many Villanova alums, so, and reach out to them. I mean, they're, people are very accessible. If you get a call, if I get a call from someone saying, hey, Kate, you know, I'm a Villanova alum, I'm thinking of getting into wealth management, I'm going to send a resume along. Uh, asking your parents if they have advisors or if you have a neighbor or somebody in your family who you know, has advisors, ask them, them to forward your resume. And you have to be resourceful. You have to, I mean, it's very competitive right now. And I think the best thing you can do to, eat, you know, to increase your chances of getting a job is to get a personal introduction to somebody who will forward your resume and do something. And I think that's a really um, an easy thing that a lot of people don't do that. So use your connections. Um, and you know, I think another side of it is be your natural self. If you're naturally somebody who likes dealing with people and likes working with people, um, some of the characteristics I said before, if you're a waitress or caddy and you've done that before, I think that's a, a real, those people do really well. And I think Villanovans do really well in wealth management. Uh, we're very well-rounded, very social. Those are kind of good, um, good characteristics. And, you know, we're looking for people who like to solve problems. So that's... You know, using the social side of it, but also the, you know, you're kind of using both sides of the brain. You know, you have to be friends with your clients and, you know, or I do. So it's, you know, if you're someone who's very good at that and has a lot of friends and is, likes making, you know, individual connections, I think that's great. And then having the, the, the finance background is huge because you're able to kind of relate, you know, complex issues to a person. So you have to kind of have both of it, but I think it's a... Um, it's, uh, they're good characteristics to have. And then um, internships are huge. Uh, those, you, your internship is really a stepping stone to meet as many people as you can. So if you're getting, looking into getting into wealth management, the there's um, offices, a lot of local offices in New York City, you know, try, call directly to the office and ask to, if you could put your resume in. I mean, you could do that. That's, it's very easy to do. You don't have to, they don't have to post a, a site, but you know, say you're interested in doing an internship, you know, who's the best person to speak with? What is the hiring process? I mean, you could call local branches or even branches in the city. But when you get that internship, the job, the real role is to, it's a stepping stone to meet other people. And you want to meet as many people as you can at the company, because then, I mean, my intern from last year is a Villanova alum, or this year, and, you know, we'll give her a job next year. I mean, she was great, and she made connections. People liked her. If it's not my team that hires her, it's going to be somebody else. So, you know, she was a very social person. So she was, you know, meeting people and always offering to help out. So I think those are really good um, things when you're, um, if, if you're getting an internship, and everybody should have internships at, at some point, whether it's, you know, your freshman year, sophomore year, I mean, those are the people you're competing against. I mean, they, I've seen resumes, it's like, wow, when did you even go to college? I mean, they, they're, they look better than mine. So you have to really, you want to beef up the resume as much as possible with as many different things as possible. Um, I don't know, what else? You nailed it. All right, that's it. There, it where we wherever you want to go. Yeah. Gets, me out of my up seat. A Get, gets me out of my seat for a few minutes, I know we said. Start, start shaking if I think I sit down in a chair for too long and I like to walk around a little bit. So, uh, my name is Chris Weidler and I'm uh, currently the, um, the, the interim CFO for uh, Barclays in the Americas as well as being the financial controller. And what I think I'd like to do is just talk, touch on a couple of things. And may, maybe the first and, and foremost is, is I think just for the fact that you guys are in this room, you are ambitious, you do care about your career. What I'd also like to ask you to do is have some fun, right? You're, you're in college. All of us up here, I think, will talk about the fact that uh, we like to have fun now, but certainly there probably wasn't a better time in our lives to have fun than, than we were in college. So please don't forget that, despite everything that we say up here. It is entirely possible to have a 3-6, have an internship, and be part of lots of clubs, um, especially as George and Bill tell they were, in a, they were in a fraternity, and while they had a leadership position, I'm sure there was there was quite a lot of fun back in those days as well. So, uh, you know, hopefully you guys can take that on and do that. And 
I guess I'd like to talk about two other things. The first is a couple of observations I have on an interview process. And then second, I'd like to talk about what I do, which is finance. And um, just added it to what the guy said, which, which is incredibly important. Um, but you know, there's, there's a few other things that I think that I think are relevant and practical, and, and that's to show a level of enthusiasm. Right? We talked about this, but people want to know that you are engaged, right? And and I've always found to that point, it's actually okay to be a little bit nervous. Now that doesn't mean you're shaking and sweating and doing all those things, but there's something about a little bit of energy in the room that shows that you guys really care what you're doing. Right? And you care why you're here. That, that uber confident person who walks into the room um, and feels like they're trying to control the interview on you, um, it, th there's almost a sense of entitlement or, or something that comes with that. So, so understand that, that what confidence is important. This is a start for you guys, right? So energy and a little bit of that nervous energy can actually help in some places. Um, you know, don't oversell yourself as well, right? If you land a cash register, at the local Dixie Mart, or whatever the case may be, you ran the cash register. It still showed you had ambition. Um, you didn't magically ma manage the budgetary finance process for the entire organization. Um, so, you know, we, we do look through those things, and it's important to be honest when you represent it, right? The fact that you had the initiative to take a job is, is critical. Um, and uh, cursing, I think somebody said that, but I can't tell you how, you know, when the, when the beginning of an interview goes well and you feel like you bond with somebody, how, they suddenly slouch down in the thing, and then there's an F-bomb or, or a couple of other four-letter words that come out because they think that they've got this nice relationship going with you. And um, I can assure you, cursing is always something that does not go down well uh, in an interview. If there's a time that you can hold it, that, that's about right. Um, just wanted to talk a little bit about finance and what we do given everything that's going on. And, 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 and as I've said last year, and I'd say again, the role of finance and operations in some of these other areas is becoming so important in the organization. And that's because when I think about this at Barclays, and I don't know if it's similar to some of the other organizations, but every time our CEO, um, even, I guess we're on our second one this week, so um, even, even uh, they would say that you know, the, the, the agenda has changed, right? The agenda has changed not from how much revenue can we make, but how can we deal with this changing regulatory environment? Okay, there's Dodd-Frank out there, there's Basel III, there are a lot of regulations coming down. How do we deal with that? Second, how do we deal with our regulators, right? I don't know about the rest of us, but I say I probably spend about 50% of my time on dealing with regulators and how they're doing inquisitions and reviews of us at a bank. How do you deal with those? Okay, um, a shift away from just revenue to returns, right? How are we showing our shareholders that we're making money on the resources that we have? And oh, by the way, when you link that back to the regulatory environment, those resources are becoming more scarce, right? So what are the decisions to make there? How in all of that do you become then the trusted business advisor, right? So someone who can partner with the front office, okay? And then lastly, how do you protect the reputational risk of the firm? It doesn't take you guys to open up the newspaper a heck of a lot and see this whole list of, of things that are going on and banks being hit on the side of the ship with, okay, it's a libel thing, it's money laundering, it's all of those things. Who are the people who have the seat at the table there and are more valued than ever? It's your finance colleagues, it's compliance, it's legal, it's operations, okay? From when I started in this industry 15 years ago to where I am now, the seat at the table that finance and other teams have is all the way at the top, right? Because you can't make those decisions and influence the outcome and understand what it means to your firm without actually having your finance partners who are the subject matter experts at the table for that, or operations or some of the other areas. So just in terms of what we thought was great in sales and trading, those are still fantastic jobs. The way that you engage in the vision of business and the interest of moving away from being just a scorekeeper to actually a trusted business advisor is what people like Todd and myself are seeing on a daily basis. And that really not only means that, hey, we need more people in those areas, but the, 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 the type of work and the interest that you find there is, is just exceptional. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about that, and that's, that's sort of how our world's expanded in finance. And then lastly, um, back to the interview point, and I'll leave you with a story that I'll always remember, which is be careful about your preparation. Know what you know, but maybe not too much. And we had a great interview recently at Barclays where somebody came in and clearly read three of our press releases and said, 
Um, went through a whole bunch of details. Oh, I so you got to do this, and the return on capital is this, and they even made up three or four ratios that I've absolutely never heard of, but I think what they did is cobbled together three or four press releases. And then I ended it by saying, well, what actually questions do you have for me? Well, how do you like working at HSBC? Hmm. Clearly, they have read a lot of things and had no idea who they were actually interviewing with. So while I think it was partially in their brain, they were trying to remember, memorize every detail of those press releases. And then at the end, it was, oh, well, uh, how do you work at HSBC? HSBC. I had to remind them I worked at Barclays. Um, they quickly recovered, of course, but at that point, you know, there, there may be an area where, you know, a little bit less is more. So be confident in knowing some things, but you don't have to know everything about our bank, right? So um, I leave you with that, and uh, hopefully there will be all the questions. So. Uh, just to correct Mr. Donnell, my name's actually Sean Connor. Chris is my dad. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> no, no, no. Well, he was just looking at me. I probably looked as old as your dad. Um, but yeah, as you mentioned, I'm a senior finance major. And uh, over the past year, I've done about 20 or 25 interviews, you know, be it on the phone or on campus or you know, at the Super Days. So I just want to tell you guys some things that I think I could have done better and some things that I think I probably did well throughout the process. Um, you know, first off, preparation. I mean, everybody sort of hit that point. but. It's, it's huge. I mean, my very first interview was uh, over the phone for Jeffries for investment banking. And I think I was in between classes. And the first question he asked me was, you know, walk me through a discounted cash flow analysis. And I had no idea. And the, uh, the interview ended there. And uh, definitely did not get that, that offer. <laughs> um, but, you know, particularly with, with phone interviews, you really have an advantage where you can sit at your desk and you can have your laptop open. You can have all of your notes. You can have a calculator. Um, and I made sure that I did that for every phone interview after that. Um, so that's something I would I would definitely recommend. Um, you know, one you know when you when you do poorly in an interview like that, you definitely kind of feel like an idiot. But you know, every single new interview is sort of a fresh start, so you do have the opportunity to rebound from that. Um, another thing that I really didn't do, and I definitely should have, was to utilize the uh, career center here. Um, I mean, the Calais Center offers a lot of really good tools for interviews. They set up uh, mock interviews. You know, they have an alumni database, so you can look up. You know, Villanova alumni that work whatever company you're applying for, and you could reach out to them. Um, and it's definitely a good tool to uh, you know get you in the right direction. Um, another thing, I think it was George that touched on this about handshakes. Uh, one of my interviews, I think the first thing I did was I got all fingers and you know no palm at all, and it just totally threw off the vibe of the entire interview after that. Um, and I you know, ruined the ruined the chance of getting that offer. So it actually makes a huge difference. Uh, it's tough because sometimes you go right for eye contact, you don't look down, but um, you know, after a while, you get the hang of it. So that's uh, handshakes are definitely big. Um, and lastly, one thing that I didn't do, which is very important, is after every interview you have, make sure that you ask them for their business card, and that the next day you follow up and send them an email. Um, you know, reintroducing yourself. They probably won't remember who you are, but if you include some kind of anecdote from the conversation, at least it keeps it fresh in their minds of who you are. And you know, when they are asked how they thought about different candidates, they know who you are going forward. Um, moving on to things that I, I think I did well throughout the process. Um, first of all, I, I think I really knew my resume front to back um, fairly well, which is really important. I mean, one of the most common interview questions that you're going to get is, walk me through your resume. Um, so you want to be able to have you know, a 30 second, to 60 second sort of synopsis of every line. And you want to be able to utilize that to sort of tell a story about why you want the position that you're applying for. Um, so that's definitely very big. Um, and you, know, you need to be able to communicate during that process. You know, I, uh, George wanted me to talk about um, the trading presentations we had to do at the end of our internship. Um, basically, at the end of the entire summer, uh, every intern had to present a trade idea to about, I think, 15 managing directors and you know, 10 senior traders. Um, and it was, it was pretty, pretty scary. And uh, you know, I watched you know, MIT math majors who were trying to do exotic derivatives and ridiculous trade ideas just get decimated by questions. Um, so I was able, fortunately I went last, so a lot of the uh, more senior people left at that point. But I was able to just take a really broad position. I think uh, the premise was we had $10 million cash notional to use. I think I said I'd buy $10 million worth of 30-year U.S. Treasuries. Really the most basic position you can take, and I was just really able to defend that. You know, talk about a viewpoint on Europe, and it was tough for anyone to get in there and ask me a difficult question that I couldn't answer. Um, so if, if, you can, if you can talk and you can communicate with people, you know, you, Maybe if your financial knowledge isn't as sound as others, you can kind of get around that, uh, which is a good skill to have. Um, another thing in terms of preparing for interviews, 
definitely read the market section of the Wall Street Journal as much as possible. Uh, I think I did that about every day for two weeks leading up to my interviews, and it just sort of, A, gives you a perspective of what's going on in the world, and B, it gives you talking points, um, which is the biggest thing that you want to have throughout the interview. Um, I think my, my interview for Bank of America Merrill Lynch was on campus with an alumni, Bob Wright, and the first question he asked me was, you know, what do you think about what's going on in Europe? And the entire interview, we just had a conversation about the European sovereign debt crisis, and that was it, which was great, because he probably could have came in and asked me other questions that I didn't know, oh, well. and uh, definitely expressed interest in taking the offer. Um, I was talking to Mr. Dinell this morning about it, actually. Um, you know, when I, uh, after I interviewed, I had my super day in New York for Bank of America Merrill Lynch, I was sort of in a limbo phase where they kind of didn't really give me the offer yet, but I was still sort of on the sideline in case someone turned it down. But I made sure that I called you know, twice a week for about a month, um, just telling them that if I had the opportunity, I would take it. And I think you know, somebody else who probably had multiple offers on the table and didn't really get back to them, they just took me over that person because I, you know, I had definitively expressed that I would take the offer. Um, so I think that's big. You know, if, if they know that you're committed and that you definitely want to do it, it can definitely go a long way. Um, you know, probably the most important thing that I think I did well is networking. And I think Villanova you know, is head and shoulders above any other, for any other school in terms of uh, networking, particularly for Wall Street firms. Um, Bank of America particularly had an awesome uh, platform. I think we had bi-monthly or bi-weekly phone calls with just the Villanova students working at the bank, you know, updating us on what was going on, telling us about alumni we could reach out to. Um, you really want to try and talk to as many people as possible because A, you get your name out there, and B, you can solicit advice. And Villanova alumni actually love helping out Villanova students. I mean, if you shot out 10 different emails to alumni, probably nine of them would get back to you looking to help you out, uh, which is pretty cool. And I don't think any other school, at least from the kids that I interned with, uh, had that at all. Um, and lastly, you know, just be yourself during the interview. Uh, I think a lot of guys are, are fairly normal. You know, they know you're a 19, 20, 20 year old kid, and you might not know everything about the market. Um, and they can probably relate to someone like a Villanova student who's just being humble and being themselves better than you know, like a quantum physics major from MIT who's trying to be incredibly technical. You know, if you don't know the answer to a question, just be honest and say you don't know. I think it goes a lot, a lot further than trying to dance around it. And, and people can see right through that. So, uh, But yeah, that's pretty much it. I mean, if anyone wants to uh, come up to me after, grab a coffee with me for five minutes, and ask my advice, I'd honestly be more than happy to, because you know, a lot of people helped me out during my process, so don't hesitate at all. Thank you, Sean. Um, just, uh, just a couple of follow-up points. I was listening to George as he was speaking, and he talked about waitresses, caddies, McDonald's, right? He reminded me of a restaurant that I put out to the Florida Hope's house called Harry and the Natives. You pass by this restaurant and you'll see uh, pickup trucks with gun racks, motorcycles, and veterans from Jupiter Riley. And think about the experience, uh, just what you would learn from the person side working in that restaurant. Uh, the second thing I was thinking about Todd, and Todd the question I asked Todd, and I, I see this mistake over and over again, is know who you are. I think Todd and George are very right. If you think about the way to stay on that stage, if you go into a training floor, it's just about what it looks like. So, you know, if you're on an interview, you're already you're pretty intelligent, but you have to be, from my perspective, George, correct me if I'm wrong, very outgoing, be able to get along with anybody, because everybody's gonna say, do I want them on my team? Do I want to sit as close as George, Todd, and Kate? Okay, are you likable? Okay. Yes, you have to be smart. Yes, you have to be aggressive. You have to be a team player, and you have to be very like it. And then I think about Kate. Kate and I do the, a lot of the same things. But yes, you have to be a problem solver. You have to be able to help people. You have to be compassionate. You have to be able to connect with almost anybody, old or young, from the south, from the north. You need to have that skill to be able to make connections. Yes, you have to be outgoing. And then Todd, um, and I've heard Todd say this before, and I've, he, he, I've talked to people that work for Todd, you have to be a problem solver. You have to enjoy being a problem solver. Same with Chris on the finance side, being a problem solver. So, you know, both sales and trading and operations are a great field, but the person who's a problem solver working on a trading desk probably is not going to work for you. Same way if you're the ultimate extrovert 
team player and you know being very but not a problem solver working in the operational world that's not for you so understand uh, who you are um, and then I heard uh, Sean talk about getting the email out very quickly uh, Jennifer you worked for me last summer right we talked a little bit about this George Coleman how many emails do you get a day hundreds hundreds right how many written notes do you get in a week only from the best and brightest to get an interview. So think about popping an email out that night or the, the day of the interview, but think about how long it takes to write a handwritten note, two or three sentences, maybe a couple of connections. And uh, I heard that here uh, suggestion. So those are just a couple of points and just listening to- well, Billy, uh, before you leave that point, the truth is how many people here have a uh, iPhone? And everybody does, sorry. So you know, like, so, so like the truth is, you know, we, if I it's, if I'd Super Day, I just told you before, we're going to interview the five of you, and then we're going to have pizza, and we're going to decide. Tomorrow's too late. You know, you finish the interview, you're waiting for the next one. Send it right then. Get the business card, and like if I'm sitting there and I I just finished the interview, and 15 minutes later I get an email from you thanking me, it's aggressive. So like my my view on that is. As soon as the interview is over, send it. Because you, you have the ability. It's right in your hand. I've, I've literally had to tip the scales here for people where, you know, I've got five positions and I'm on the fence on two people and I can't figure out which one's going to get it. And we're sitting in that room trying to figure out it's, you know, this decision is sitting between me and a beer. And I've got to figure out who's going to get a job and who's not. And the one who sends in the mail and reminds me about the thing we talked about in the interview that really piqued her interest or really made her connect, right, that's what it's done paid attention, wrote it down, sent me the note, and I literally got it right then. Um, I, per I don't personally give out business cards. I stick one with a thumbtack on the interview schedule when I walk in the room, and almost every single student asks me, can I have your business card? I said, I don't bring one, I brought one with me, it's outside on the, on the door. It's amazing how few people actually go outside, write down the information, and send me an email. Right? If you give out the business cards, you, you typically get the email back, but it's a generic, non-personal, no connection to the interview, nothing to remind me what we talked about. Um, if the ones who actually go out, take the two seconds to write it down and send me the mail are the ones that will then can tip the scale. But, but not to, con I'm gonna contradict myself now. I do think that sending it right away is spot on. On the other hand, the handwritten note leaves a very strong impression. And so even if it's not that day, you know, it, it gives you the opportunity to revisit, and there are scenarios where we have, we're not making the decision on the spot. Well, and to Sean's point, right, when, when you get left on the fence, right, those are the kinds of things that get you over the fence, right? Those things, if you didn't get the offer that day, but then somebody backs out or rescinds an offer, that's how you get back on the list. Yes. So this is the point, to, uh, this is your time. Anybody, we open it up to the floor, anybody have a question? Yeah. You know, 90, 95 years worth of experience up here, and uh, you know, one summer analyst, but now new employee, senior. Uh, so, uh, any questions? How can we help you? Do we have a microphone up here? On both yeah, sides. there's microphones on both sides. Uh, or if you're not going to get up, just you know, yell it out. But any, any, anybody, any questions? Sure. Can you hear me? Question is, if I got it right, is uh, sophomore business major? How can you do this? What can you do this summer? Right. right. Yeah. So what would you do? Be doing your sophomore summer as opposed to your junior summer? Right. right? I, th I think I think we gave you two answers. You know, it's like the truth is, if you want to work in sales and trading, investment banking, that opportunity does not exist. It just it doesn't exist. Yeah. You know? Um, so you, you, you can go be a waitress, or you, you can be a caddy, or you can go work for Kate, because Kate told you that you know, in private wealth, you can get internships, you can work for Bill Donnell, Kate, anyone in private wealth. Um, Todd, I don't know if you can work in operations and, and such. Um, it's 10 times harder, right? The, the opportunities are reserved, not exclusively, but certainly we, we heavily protect the positions we have for the rising seniors, 
Because what we're trying to do is take that 10-week interview, and that's what your internship is, a 10-week interview, and make sure that we're going to invest the hundreds of thousands of dollars training somebody in somebody we actually want to hire. Right? There's nothing wrong with doing that twice, but the chances are if you, if you land an internship somewhere after your sophomore year, you're probably looking to do something else somewhere after your junior year because why not diversify your experience? And to me, that's a very valuable seat to use up. Now, it doesn't mean I haven't met exceptional people and given them an offer in their sophomore year, um, but I think your chances are probably more likely if you went to a, a boutique shop or you use your, your family network. You know, if you've got a, an uncle that works in a small shop that can give you an opportunity to see how, you know, a kind of jack of all trades firm or maybe a small broker dealer that really only deals in the securities business, not in derivatives, give you an idea to see what happens in a smaller shop. And then you go and try to t turn that into an experience that helps you know, give you an edge up the following year. Yeah. You know, there's nothing wrong with working down in D.C., somewhere in the government. Um, I would suggest Jennifer Richahan. Jennifer Miley, she's a, she's a year older than you. She worked for me this summer in wealth management. Uh, wealth management is a great place to be, you know, for freshman and sophomore, if you want to do something like that. But I would suggest that you ask uh, Jennifer. I actually graduated college a long time ago. Oh, you yeah. <laughs> did? <laughs> I, I also think you, that hedge funds are, are very interested. You know, you have to network your way in, but you know, they, they like cheap labor. They can do research for them. Yes, sir. Do companies like yours value summer internships that are somehow paid over studying abroad? So the question is, do uh, say anything more? What do companies see more value in studying abroad for a summer? So the question is, do companies value more a, a paid internship or studying abroad? Yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe I can talk about this. I, and this is coming from someone I've spent seven years of my career um, in London, uh, both with PwC and, and uh, with, with Barclays. And um, it's, cer it's certainly something that we look to as a differentiating factor. Um, the, the, the world is getting much smaller and your ability to interact with different people at different levels um, and across different cultures is, is as invaluable um, from, from my perspective um, and, and for what we look for um, as is a paid summer internship. Now, you know, clearly there's the, the combination of the two is even more powerful. You know, it's, it's just that, you know, the cultural differences within a firm between someone who's in finance and operations and the front office um, mean you have to interact with that group of people differently and you know just that core skill you will continue to develop over overseas and um, you know it's, cer it's certainly something we rate very highly um, and and sort of you know two people with a summer internship that was paid one of them has a, a period of time uh, abroad it's a differentiating factor. I think the, the other thing I'd add there is any of these things can be phenomenal or they can be nothing. Right? It depends on how you make that part of the story that is your 22-minute sales pitch. Right? You're supposed to, this is, you get 80% plus of the talking time if you're with a good interviewer. You get 22 minutes because you don't get the full 30. Right? We had a little paperwork in the beginning with it. We're going to end some introduction. There's some, some Q&A time. You get 22 minutes to sell yourself. If you can work that summer you spent in Siena with the art history program or in London with the London School of Economics program or over in Beijing, and you can work that into why that makes you a better candidate and what you learn and the experience you got from that and how you grew. And if it, you put that into the picture that is you and you leave that me with a picture in my head of why I need to hire you, it's phenomenal. If you can do that better with an internship that you had, and it, the art is learning how to take that experience and make it part of the picture that is you, why you're different, why you're unique, and why I want to hire you. Um, I, I think that's the message. I can probably spin any experience into a positive thing in a resume. And I think when George talks about McDonald's, I mean, it's true. Most of you would have thought that's not what would be you know, prominent. If you can talk about how that allowed you to, to learn personal responsibility and accountability and to see what it's like for most of America that works a hell of a lot harder for the money they get paid than we do, right? those are great life lessons to learn. Right? If you can turn that into your sales pitch, those, things, those messages leave an image in our head. Yes, sir. Um, how much of a disadvantage in someone who is working at a 
second job as opposed to someone who was working at one of the big banks, Merrill Lynch, Credit Suisse, Barclays, and did the full-time summer thing and then <coughs> got the job offer right away going to a senior like Sean. How much is someone at this bench who is also going to a senior year and didn't do the whole big bank summer internship program? How many, well, I'm asking, how many spots are you guys looking to fill that aren't the, the kids, the guys the girls that were uh, working? It's a very good question. It's a, it's a good question, and the answer is it depends on what year. You know, so you know the economy is not, it's, it's improving, but it's not good enough. Uh, I would say that 90% of Credit Suisse's needs in sales and trading and investment banking have been filled. So it's it's it, whereas you know if it was robust, you know that, you know and by the way, maybe we'll get lucky. You know maybe maybe by April things will be good again, and we'll feel like we're short people, and all of a sudden we'll be on the hurry up offense to you know, find people, but the, the truth of the matter is, is at least for the things I work in, investment bank, um, it's kind of over, if you're a senior. And I, I know that's kind of harsh, but it's, I don't, I'm going to tell you the truth. I don't know if it's true or not. Yeah, I think when Chris asked, you know, about the questions you ask at the end of the interview, you know, asking how I got my start in this business, useless question. The world has changed a lot in the last 20 years. But, but now, the way you get my job, or you get a job working for me, is through a summer internship program. In the biggest boom years, 75, 80% of my spots are filled with summer interns, you know, returning summer interns who were offered a job the previous summer. In tough times like we are now, better than 90% are filled out of that summer program. There are fewer spots, and more of them are filled with summer interns. So it's, it's tough. It's not impossible. It's not zero. But the chances of people coming to a campus like this in the fall of your senior year looking for May grads with 15 openings, that's not happening this year. Okay, but there's going to be a non-zero, and I, I, I certainly would. This is this is the year we got to dig into your network and find different ways to get your foot in that door to get into opportunities. But, but having said that, I think, it, and I apologize, it's the right question: is don't give up. You know, just because I we both told you that you know the, the, the degree of difficulty is high, you know, it's a lot easier for you than it was on the 09 grads. You know, the 09 grads, you know, you know, Lehman had gone down, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and I, I'm just thinking of one Villanova person in particular who um, was very persistent in staying in touch with me and had met the HR people, you know, through me. He was very persistent in that. And then, some, I don't know why, but something happened and they brought him in for the, some, the rates area needed somebody. And, you know, one thing led to another and he's, he works with me now. So it, it, it can happen, but, you know, persistence. Let me just answer that in, in another way also, because I think it's a really good question. So, Bank of America Merrill Lynch, there's zero opening in sales and trading or investment banking, but we are coming down in two weeks for a position like Chris Hamels, you know, with, uh, the CFO of the financial side. We're coming down for operations not on, on, the, on the institutional side, but on the wealth management side. But I would tell you that that's the big banks, okay? You work at boutique. So, and you're not the only one in this room who are on this campus. You know, the, the hiring cycles for small firms and for hedge funds and private equity firms is completely different. It's not, you know, you work your junior summer, you get hired a year before. A lot of that is based on need because people come and go from all the time. So probably, you know, I, if I were in your shoes, I'd be looking at some of these smaller firms because there's, or these hedge funds or these, private equity firm because it's just a different need and it's a different hiring cycle. Yeah, I can tell you though unequivocally that I'm not smart to tell you when this is going to turn but the last when we got out when Billy and I graduated in 77 and 78 you know history is, will tell you that it was just like now it was awful you know and and you know Billy's first job was to go sell toothpaste you know my first job was to go work for a, a benefits company you know it, it's like sometimes you have to do something else you take those skills, and then when the bull market gets going, we're going to be short people. We're, we are going to be so short people, we're going to be scrambling. So if you're at a boutique, and two years from now you've developed your skills, and you've developed relationships with people that we respect, and you know, I have a need, and you can fill that need, you're going right to the table, right away. So you know, it, it, there are many, many ways. To, you know, when, I, when I look at the people on the management committee, there's 12 people on the equity management committee that half of us kind of went through the program, which I did, and the other half we hired from someplace else, you know, and, and it could have easily been P PwC, it could have been, you know, there's lots of different ways, there's just lots of ways, so just do something. Especially outside the big firms, it's important to remember that 
besides the internship turns into full-time analyst program track, right, the rest of hiring on Wall Street doesn't actually fit a May, June graduation schedule. Okay? When we have the biggest turnover of headcount every year, it's somewhere between New Year's and when checks clear. Okay? So that January, February time is a huge turnover and opportunity time. It's not going to make you or your parents real happy if I'm telling you you might be waiting until the New Year, but keep your network going all the way into January. Because you know, if you haven't found the thing you're looking for, find something productive to do with your time, but keep working your network. Because come January, February, opportunities, and maybe it's not full time, maybe it's, it's partnering up with a, a temp agency that's under one of these big banks. You know, if you're set on being in a big bank, those are places where you can get an opportunity to come in the door, do whatever you can do, and then get that converted into a permanent role you know, sometime in the future. Yeah, and I mean, I, I think one other thing that's, that's really important and I'm noticing, but it's, it's on topic and possibly with the, the international as well is, you know, working in a Wall Street job doesn't necessarily mean Wall Street anymore. Um, you know, with, with technology and everything else, the, the expansion of the type of work that we do across the U.S. Um, means there are plenty of jobs. I just spent a few days down in Texas and it's clear that there are plenty of open jobs. You know, for people with these types of skills who want to do these things, um, it's just the, the world has expanded from being sort of Wall Street jobs very focused on actually Wall Street uh, to, to, to other parts of the U.S. where, where there are plenty of jobs. Um, yeah, tomorrow I'm in Baltimore. I've got 57 yeah. people work for me in Baltimore. I'm spending the day in the office there. Um, our, our investment management business is right here in West Conshohocken. I'm one of the few people at Morgan Stanley can say that word because I drank there a lot. <laughs> um, but there's, you know, we have more Stanley Investment Management right here. So there's, there are jobs, you know, Vanguard and, and, uh, and other guys right here on the main line. Um, yep, and, you know, it's, it's, it's just important that you have that, you know, on, on top of being fun and getting to see different parts of the world and the country, it's, uh, there's opportunity there. Okay, we have to uh, wrap this up. It's, uh, well, here, but one more. You, 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 you tried before. Right. Um, I'm just a sophomore. So <laughs> we'll get two more. We'll do two more. <laughs> I'm sorry, start over? I'm just a sophomore. Okay. But um, if, let's say the economy doesn't heat up in two years. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the benefit of getting an MBA, let's say, after your undergraduate education? Does that help? Or? Nope. Go get a job for three years first. Maybe not in our business. You know, if you want to come back to Wall Street, that's fine. And, and there, I don't know of any accredited MBA program in this country that will get you a job on Wall Street that will allow you to go directly from undergraduate into an MBA program. Um, I would, I would just say that if you're going to go get an MBA, go get one from a like, top five school, top eight school. Uh, you know, and, and I don't know how, I don't know how the admissions works, but my advice is if you were my son, I'd tell you to go work for Procter & Gamble or Xerox. Get some sales, assuming you want to be a salesman or something, but get some skills. You know, go work for PwC or something. I mean, in our structured products area, which I don't want to get into, but it's, a, it's, it's our most profitable department. And when I look at the bios of the people who run it, they all worked for a big four. It was a big four now. <laughs> you know? It was big eight when I was your age. So, um, but but they all worked for the big four firms. Um, you know, and then we hired them ten years ago, and now they're running the department. So there's just lots of ways to do this. Like don't, you know, if, if it doesn't work out, there are lots of things to do, um, and many many ways to develop your skills, keep the network going, and and you know. I mean, I would tell you, and I don't want to spend waste any more time because we got to get out, but I didn't start in the industry until I was 29. So everyone loves to hear that because the hope springs eternal. Gee, if it happened to him, it could happen to me. But I had to go do some other things. Well, it does turn and turn very, very quickly. So just okay, just that the gentleman behind you. Uh, what advice would you offer to a student that has offered a deadline approaching his rate growth curves? Hit the bed. Hit the bid. Take the job. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, in that case, uh, I'm not going to get into this morning at a time, uh, but I would talk to uh, Nancy Dudak or Carol Lloyd about the new reneg policy here on campus. Uh, it's, uh, it's pretty serious. It's a pretty serious thing here uh, at the moment. So anyway, let me just kind of sort of close this up a little bit. Um, you juniors, raise your, raise your hands. Anybody that's a junior. There is a lot of resources on uh, uh, campus, uh, one of which is at the Career Center. The other one is at the ASB, is another one at AS. Don't let your first interview in a couple of months 
be the first interview. Get down there and take your resume, do a couple of practice uh, interviews. Sit down your resume, do, do some practice interviews, they'll take you down there, they'll critique you down there. Uh, get your resume checked, it's got to be perfect. If you submit a resume and you know, Todd, Todd gets uh, 100, 100 different resumes, he doesn't pull you, you don't even get a chance. So that resume has got to be perfect. So use those two centers. Those three centers, they're there for you, they're free for interviewing, uh, for interviews. Uh, Chris said, you know, the sample question, they have 100 different questions, they have an investment bank. Use those resources that you have on campus. Um, on behalf of all of our panelists, we'd like to thank you for all coming. We'll be around for a little while after. Um, I think I need to turn this program over to. Billy, did, did Brenda give them slides that they have asked? Uh, Michelle? Whatever. Okay. If, if, if she doesn't give them to you, make sure you ask Brenda if you want. Michelle Galloway or Brenda Silver, either one of those two. This entire deck that you saw that George had up there, um, you can get that from Brenda Silver or Michelle Galloway. I'll start with Michelle Galloway first. Uh, there's, a lot, there's a lot of great information George does this each year, but all the questions that you're going to need are in that packet. So, the no. Yes, sir. Slides can go out to everybody who's wiped their wild card. So if you swipe your wild card to come in here, we'll send you those slides. There you go. So everybody you swipe your wild card? Good. You're going to get Thanks, And you're going to get a letter from me 10 years from now asking for a donation. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, every year, the interviewing Wall Street on Wall Street panel and networking reception is drawing a bigger and bigger audience. And I can remember three years ago when I was sitting here for the first time, um, you know, being completely terrified when I learned what exactly a sewer day meant for the first time. But really looking back, I can see how instrumental attending this event has been year after year. Uh, and in particular, taking what the panelists have said and actually implementing it. And it's been uh, really important in helping me set up my own career on Wall Street that I'll be starting uh, this upcoming June. And I know that the knowledge, insight, and motivation that you've all gained today will help lay the foundation for you to embark on your own career, well equipped, uh, even given today's uh, turbulent economic times. All of this could not have been possible without the participation and effort um, put forth by the Villanova Financial Club and all the panels today. So join me in thanking uh, them once again. I also wish to recognize the work of two particular individuals, Bill Dinell and George Coleman. Uh, we've already mentioned you know, that this is the ninth year in which we've had this event. And since its inception, Bill and George have been here brainstorming how we make this better each and every year. They've been on the panel each and every year. And they've been the ones making it successful year after year after year. So please join me in thanking them specifically for their dedication and hard work. Um, I, now I'd like to take a brief moment to talk about another event that the Equity Society will be sponsoring, and I think it will be very beneficial to all of you who are here today. Uh, it's a student tell-all life as a Wall Street intern. Um, this year's event will be taking place Wednesday, October 3rd at 5.30 p.m. in Kano Cinema, and um, just like what Sean was telling you, we'll have a panel of seniors who have been interning in different areas at different Wall Street firms. And you'll get a chance to hear about you know, their stories. Uh, it's a great opportunity to learn and hear about how the students got their internships, what they actually did during their internships, and also a chance to ask those questions that you wouldn't ask a recruiter or you wouldn't feel comfortable asking you know, an alumnus. Um, so we hope to see you guys all there, um, 5.30, right across the hall in the college cinema. And now I'd like to turn it over to Sean to uh, start off the uh, networking reception. Thank you, Rob. Uh, so I say I've attended the interview at Wall Street events every year since I've been a freshman. Uh, it's changed a lot. I remember coming in here and uh, really not knowing anything about Wall Street and hearing George speak and Bill speak and you know really scaring me about not wearing a headline shirt and making sure I wear a tie and have a firm handshake. These are all important things, guys and girls. Um, make sure you remember this night. Um, now this presentation portion of this event has ended, 
I would like to introduce the folks and companies uh, who they are representing for the uh, Financial Services Network Game Reception. Um, these Wall Street companies or recruiters have taken time with their busy schedules to be here. So I um, appreciate that and make sure you utilize them and talk to them and you know, get their business cards. So representatives, uh, I'd just like to ask that when I call your name and your company that you please raise your hand. So Bill Dinell, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch. Chris Weidler, Barclays Apple. George Coleman, Credit Suisse. Ellen uh, Patoni, Faxet. In the back, um, Cindy Corridaro, Gregory FCA, Karen Pechule, Gregory FCA, Jason Bobby, uh, Jamie Montgomery Scott LLC, um, Todd Sullivan, Morgan Stanley, Kate Waters, Morgan Stanley Smith Barley, uh, Mike Posey, uh, Stephen Nicholas, Lauren Harrington, Stephen Nicholas, Will Whitten, Stephen Nicholas. <coughs> Jerry O'Brien, Susquehanna International Group. All right, thank you everyone for coming out and go get some business cards.